So we're discussing prayer this month, and today's topic is the song of victory, because that makes sense, right? Or does it? Um, the song of victory. How many of them are there? There are at least three. So let's look at the first one that I know of, and that's in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 is the song of Moses, or Moses' song of victory after they cross the Red Sea. And it starts, I will sing to the Lord. Okay? Let's go to the next one, which is Joshua. No, it's Judges chapter 5. I went to Joshua chapter 5 anyway. Judges chapter 5. Which is the song of victory of Deborah and Barak or of Jael. And it is that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. Okay? And the last common thread. The song of victory of David, which is the one that we will look at mostly today as he triumphs over Saul. Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. All three songs of victory start just like many of the prayers that you may pray, or many of them I know that you hear. They declare that God is. They declare that God is our God. They declare that as we start, we are addressing God Most High. And these songs, like any prayer, start with dear or to or an address of the Almighty. We're going to look at the 18th Psalm, the Song of Victory of David. For those of you keeping score, make two lines. There's the, the 11 points and then scriptures and then repeat scriptures. So... Two, uh, two lines, a, a, a call and a repeat. The first one is this one. I declare that God is my God. I call to him or I sing to him or I pray to him. And that's what David does. David continues. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assail me. The cords of Sheol or of the grave or of hell entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. He takes God as problem. This is a very small snippet of his problem. But this is the problem that he takes to God nonetheless. And he's certain that God hears. In verse 6, In my distress I called uh, upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. The response is verses, although it says 1, 2, 3, I'm, I'm sorry, it should be uh, 7 through 12. The response is that God will react. God, David calls to him and he is sure that God will react. The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils the devour, and devouring foul, fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. Now all of this is a general reaction. And none of it's specific to the problem. Really, the scene that you, you get an impression of is that God is preparing His forces. He is preparing His kingdom. He is preparing His will. 
God is able to everything, right? He's able to do everything that it takes to save, to rescue, to pardon, to fix whatever that problem is. And here you get this, this idea of he has the ability to, and just to use a colloquialism, move heaven and earth to fix our problem. He prepares himself. Here for David specifically, he judges against. He judges against that thing that David has. So he come, God comes against it. The Lord also thundered in his heavens. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and, sh and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, God does something. So he's made his preparation, and then he does something. That something is to rescue David from the problem that he had. He sent from on high and he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So David gets the response. That, that he has been calling and asking for. And so he does something in return. Verse 20. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. And have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me. And his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him. And I kept myself from guilt. So David makes these actions. We've got four more. These are, it's a structural breakdown of a song. Hold in there with me. You're doing great. We're almost there. Verses 24 to 30 is God's turn and, and look back at David or really at, at all of his people as the judgment goes beyond David but also impacts Saul or Saul's house or all of the people of Israel there's that look as well. So verse 24, So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. Tortuous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord, my God, lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. And David continues on, because of God, I prevailed over my enemy. Verses 31 to 42. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The Lord who emptied me with strength and made, me, and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend the bow of bronze. You have given me a shield of your salvation, the shield of your salvation. Your right hand supported me. Your gentleness made me great. You gave me a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back until they were consumed. I trust them. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise and they fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. And you made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me that those who hated me I destroyed and those who hated me I destroyed. 
They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them as fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like mire in the streets. So David wins, right? But it's more than just winning. He wins more than the battle. Long term, God was on his side. They called to God and God didn't answer them. So God, so, so David recognizes that in 43 to 45. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as I had heard, as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. What an incredible picture of victory. That they came trembling out of the thing that they took strength and refuge and solace in. Because of that, David praises God. As the Lord, uh, the Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you were exalted. Uh, yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So David sings the song. So this is David's song of praise. And this is just 11 points that I've broken down for how that goes. Which is a very pitiful way to praise God compared to what David is, is inspired to write. But we needed to break it down so that I could make points on it now. As we open a psalm, or as we open not a song but a prayer, we do it the same way. Because Jesus instructed us to do this. And he's giving an example. When asked for an example of how to pray, that is exactly how Jesus starts. Our, uh, when you're going to pray, do it like this. Start with addressing who it is you're praying to. And I think it's not coincidence that the song of praise that or the song of victory that Moses lists, that the song of victory that uh, Deborah, Barak, or Jael, that they list, the one that David lists, that, and the way that we pray, just all of this works together with, first I want you to know who it is that's important here. By calling on God, you immediately subject yourself underneath. By asking a higher power for something, you have to acknowledge that that thing is a higher power. And whatever it is, you don't, uh, the, you're not making a demand, but you're making a request of who is above. When you're doing that, you bring the problem to him. As we have scripture, as David is, is talking about uh, being entrapped or ensnared or encompassed by death all around him. Is that any different than, than the problem that we would, any problem that we would want to take to God? If it's weighing on our hearts, if it's keeping us from being able to picture our salvation or question his pattern or his plan, when we're told to bring everything to him and to lay it down before him. And that's just what David does. Bring it to God and lay it down before him. David knows that God is, is seeing him, is hearing him, is that God is listening to what it is that he has to say. And we're instructed to do the same thing whenever we have something that we bring before God, that we approach his throne in confidence that he is listening to what it is that he is able to know what it is that we're asking about or that we are concerned with and that he can help us with that or he can provide the answer for that thing. We know that God will react. Well, God already reacted to the big one. Right? Of all of the problems that we have in this world, they're only problems of this world. Whether that's sickness or, or 
um, money, financial problems, or any of uh, the uh, lack of those blessings that we prayed about just a few moments ago, especially when the air conditioner breaks or the hurricane knocks the, air, the power out or whatever it is, all of those things are trivial, even our health, if we didn't have our soul. After all, what would, it, what would be the advantage if we gained the whole world but lost our soul? And God already shows assurance to us that He's listening in that the first thing He starts doing when man makes a mockery of life and partakes of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is set into motion a plan to bring us back, to fix that problem. He starts moving heaven and earth to do that. He starts laying down prophecy. He starts setting out example. How much easier is it to go to God with confidence that he will answer? When you know that the first problem that we ever had, 6,000 years before we were ever born, he already started working on a, a, a solution for that. And 2,000 years before we got here, Solved the problem. But if he's already done that, how much easier is it to go f to him and ask for, f for whatever it is? There's a side A and a side B then. God will give judgment against. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. There are those who stand against, right? This is the part of the song that David sang where the enemies got rocked, right? This is where God came against the enemies and it talks about the arrows that were scattered and how uh, the judgment was made against them. That they were going to get what's coming to them. The strongest rock that Satan could fling against the Savior hit square. And Jesus died. But death could not hold him. So Satan lost. The battle and the war. So there's side A. Side B is because of that, we have ransom. We have been paid for. We have been fixed. In, second, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at the very end of verse 3, our God, uh, God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony, uh, the testimony given at the proper time. Now, isn't this how someone fixing something works? God comes down and fixes sin by breaking sin. He gives you life by breaking sin. Because God comes down and fixes it, there is the people that fell to David and the triumph of David. There is those who will succumb to sin and there are those who will be ransomed from it. There's an A side or a B side and an A as, as it works out. So God has provided the rescue or the ransom for us which calls on our action. What are you going to do about it if you've received rescue and, and ransom? Peter says, Repent and be baptized for every uh, one of you in the name of Jesus Christ have been forgiven of your sins uh, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone to whom our Lord calls to himself with many other words. He bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Having done that, you've done that. So, move on in victory, right? That's the point of, uh, that Uncle Joe brought up a couple of times. I actually started to get the quote that, that he had brought in the other day that Andrew has in a book about being able to move forward, not afraid of God, but assured of the salvation that he has given to you. 
That doesn't mean once saved, always saved. And I'm not trying to put that, but God's not going to do anything to remove you out of His hand as long as you stay there. So our actions should be to dwell and delight in His salvation. All have been called to be saved, as we have, have just read. Because of God, I prevail over the foe. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which I thought was going to get referenced this morning, but not quite get to get there. In verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that how so many of our prayers are ended? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a really dark, or not dark, it was a really clouded way for me to go through all of the things that you could bring to God because the biggest one he's already fixed. The biggest thing you could ever ask for is your soul. And he's already fixed that. I tried to make it as clear as possible. It was probably, it's still kind of clouded for me. But that's the hardest thing we could ask for. The biggest thing that we could ask for. That's that one Christmas present that you have on your list that you know no one can afford. Because there was only one price for it ever. And that price was paid. Since that price was paid, it's yours. You've got it. So what confidence you can move forward with. What victory we have in Jesus. But it's more than victory. And it means more than just being able to walk forward with a smile on our face, rejoicing in the salvation that we have. It means that the salvation is real and it's tangible and it's a thing. And behold, I, and I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb with the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, just to backtrack because it's been a while since we went through this in Revelation, that number encompasses all of those who have ever been saved ever. Okay? And I heard the voice of heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of thunder. And the voice that I heard was uh, like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Now, the, the loud voice, that, that means judgment or declaration by God. And this one is going to be one that, that brings a positive thing with those harpists. And they were singing a new song uh, before the throne. And before the four living creatures and the elders, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed out of the earth. Now, that, that's for those who are saved. Where is it being played? Before the throne. Where do the prayers of the saints go up like incense? Before the throne. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Back, uh, these have followed the Lamb wherever He goes. Those who have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Back to that action set that we are called for. It's more than winning. It's, it's heaven forever. And in heaven we'll sing a new song. We'll praise God as part of that new song. They sang the song of Moses. Hey, we started that one. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Both of those representations of those who have gained victory. The victory from the law or through the law of Moses. And the victory through Christ the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations who will not fear, O Lord uh, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come to you and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. And like David ends his uh, song, which is kind of a copy that we're going to sing 
here in just a moment if you want to open to your invitation song. We praise God. We get to do that before the throne. This is a very difficult, very difficult sermon to write. And I hope that we've gained something from it. David shows an example of prayer. Deborah and Barak show an example of prayer. Moses shows an example of prayer. The New Testament scriptures point us to communicating with God. In one of the Thessalonian letters it's written, and it's, it gets given its own one little bitty verse, this three words, it's pray without ceasing. And while I can't figure out how to pray without ceasing all the times, there are times that you just can't get a song out of your head. Those are called earworms or earwicks. I think they're earworms. But they just get stuck in your head and you can't get rid of them. Well, as we've looked at how songs and prayers are so closely related and how that one really could just be another, who are you praying to or singing to if that's the thing that's stuck in your head? If you're trying to pray without ceasing and you're doing that through song, get that one stuck in your head, right? If that song that's stuck in your head is a prayer to God, doesn't that help with that trying to pray without ceasing? Doesn't that help with keeping your attitude turned toward God, knowing that He hears you, knowing that He's already provided the victory and that we're welcome to pray and, and to bring that before His throne, knowing that we will be provided the victory and that one day we'll get to stand in His presence and praise Him there at the end let that kind of thing get stuck in your head and hold it there 